So, okay, well, I think maybe we'll get started. It's a few minutes past the hour. I'm sure other people will come in and if people are too busy, there will be a recording so um, people can follow along from that. Um, so it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Connor Nixon today. Um, he's an astronomer and planetary scientist working at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, he's got, got his PhD from Oxford in remote sensing um, of the atmosphere of Titan. So obviously you've loved Titan for a very long time. Um, and so uh, he's also been the deputy principal investigator of the Cassini Composite Infrared Spectrometer and is very interested in studying planetary atmospheres um, of sort of the outer planets. Uh, and so he's on the sort of remote sensing spectroscopy side um, of, the, of, the, uh, of the observational house. So um, today he has very graciously agreed to talk about uh, solar system science uh, that's coming up with JWST. Um, and in particular, focusing on his, um, I guess, your favorite target, uh, focusing on what's going to be happening with JWST and Titan. So, Connor, you can take it away. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I want to thank um, Vicky for the invite to to speak to this group today. And you know, I'm really happy to to just keep it casual, take questions throughout. Stop me if you want to ask something. I want to make this as useful to to you as possible. And you know, I'm also 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 interested to learn from from you guys as well, who have a lot more uh, uh, experience in the exoplanet side, which I don't. So hopefully we can um, get a really uh, useful session today. So let's see. I'm going to try to advance my slides. Um, first, a, a thanks to um, the people on the uh, JWST Titan Science team who are listed here, uh, as as I'll describe a little bit later on, the um, this is the the GTO part of the observations, and uh, the um, there's there's a different group for different uh, objects in the solar system. So this is this is just the 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 people who worked on the Titan side. So if you include all the other, um, I think there was 10, 10 groups in all um, subdivisions of the of the GTO science. So uh, in all. Um, talking about you know sort of 100 or more people so um very many and i don't know who all of them are but i want to thank the people who uh you know helped with some of the material that i'm presenting today okay. um so what i'm going to talk about today is going to mention very briefly where we're at with jwst where the 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 mission is at um talk a little bit about the spacecraft and the instruments then i'm going to Go in more depth into a topic which uh, Vicky asked me to address, which is the, the breadth of solar system observations within um, the James Webb uh, program uh, announced so far. And then I'm going to zoom in and um, talk about Titan, which is just one little part of it, but it's the part that I know really well. So maybe, uh, you know, hopefully that will give you some um, kind of like a concrete example of some of the science that can be done. Um, because with so many programs, I obviously can't speak to all of them, but I can tell you at least. Um, the type of science that we're doing, which I think is is actually representative in some ways of many of the other um, uh, objects that are being studied. And then right at the end, I'll touch on the synergies that I see with exoplanet science. Okay. So right now, this was the latest update I could find on James Webb Telescope that it was still undergoing final testing um, at Northrop Grumman. They were doing a final kind of mirror, uh, you know, command the mirror to, to unfold and deploy. And this would be like the very last time that it's been um, uh, unfolded on Earth prior to being um, packaged up and, and shipped. The uh, launch date until pretty recently was set for Halloween. And I think that now there's been a uh, little push from the Ariane scheduling. Uh, of course, it's being launched um, by an Ariane 5 from French Guiana. And there's been a slight schedule slip. So looking at maybe a November launch is the very latest I heard. But fingers crossed it will be this year. We'll finally have this telescope in space, which has been in the works for many, 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 many years. Um, when, I, when I arrived at Goddard um, 20 years ago, this telescope was being built. So it'd be great to see it finally get launched. And as you probably know, um, James Webb is a collaboration between uh, NASA, ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency, who've contributed to the um, either the, the spacecraft or the instruments. Um, and let's see. Next slide. 
Yeah, I have a little um, video here of the deployment, which maybe you've seen it before, but it's really cool. So I'm just going to show it um, again about how this how this all works. So James Webb, as you know, um, has to operate very cold because it's it's doing infrared science. So it has this huge tennis court sized um, sunshade multi layer, which you can see kind of un unfurling and unfolding here. And uh, everything is packaged up to fit inside the fairing of the Ariane. So it's all sort of bundled up like an origami puzzle. And then once it deploys, the mirror uh, unfolds and the secondary mirror pops out. And, um, and then we'll be ready to go and observe the universe. So uh, let's see. These are the four instruments. Uh, there's the um, there's the camera, uh, near cam, which is a filter camera. Um, there's the uh, imaging spectrometer, near spec. Both those are approximately one to five microns. Uh, near cam has some filters of shorter wavelengths, but approximately one to five microns. And then at five microns, the MIRI instrument uh, takes over. Um, and that's the, the mid infrared imaging spectrometer, which goes out to 28 microns. And then there's, there's an additional kind of secret fourth instrument, which is not, not so secret anymore, but the um, originally a, a, an engineering part of the spacecraft, which is called the fine guidance sensor, um, has now been renamed um, um, NEARIS, which is the uh, near infrared imaging um, uh, science system. And uh, that uh, provides uh, another type of imaging similar to NearCam, but different, uh, different in, other, in other ways. And because there were so many upgrades done to that, uh, fine guidance sensor eventually became an instrument in its own right. And it has some, uh, some tricks that it can do that can actually provide um, slightly higher uh, spatial resolution than, than NearCam. So, so again, just to kind of look at the, the wavelength coverage, um, from approximately one micron, actually going down to about 0 0.6 microns for near spec and near cam, out to five microns, and then uh, myriads from taking over. The, um, the spectral resolution of, of near spec and MIRI um, actually sort of peaks at around the same, the same amount, which is a resolving power of about 3,000. So it's um, sort of medium, medium, low resolution, uh, depending on your, um, on your definition. Um, but uh, for some purposes, you know, this is going to be the best, uh, you know, spectral resolution that we've had for some of the windows that can't be seen from the earth. So uh, incredibly powerful. And of course, one of the major advantages of, of web is just the, um, the sensitivity uh, right across this range, which enables it to do, you know, ridiculously short integrations on many solar system objects, simply because it's just so sensitive that the most the um, the most important thing that we're worried about is not collecting too little photons, but collecting too many photons and and, and saturating parts of the spectrum. Okay, so let's look at some of the um, the science programs. So there um, there's been three um, science programs, at least that I know of. Um, the first of those being the guaranteed time observations. Um, these were essentially um, set aside time during the first year to two years um, for various purposes to kind of do um, initial surveys for, for many um, objects. Um, part of that is solar system. Um, solar system is only one out of the 10 uh, large projects, which eight of which are astrophysics projects, one of which is an exoplanets project. Um, but uh, one of those projects was a solar system project. And the the lead of that for, for, uh, for a long time has been Heidi Hamill. And uh, she was basically tasked with leading this solar system project kind of as the PI of this time. And she was given a set aside time of a pretty generous amount, I think about 110 hours to basically look at the entire solar system. And I think once that um, got a bit closer to the time when she was going to be providing observational designs, um, she realized that uh, that was a very big job and it was a job that was too big for one person. Um, so she uh, decided to recruit um, help and um, eventually took her uh, 110 hours of solar system time, split it up into 10, 10 sub projects uh, for different objects in the solar system. 
and eventually those sort of morphed into into 18 individual um, observation designs. Um, but there were sort of 10 teams covering things like there was a Mars team, there was a giant planets team. Um, I was leading the, the Titan team and there was um, comets and um, NEOs and KBOs and everything else uh, you can imagine. Uh, I'll mention there is also an exoplanets uh, GTO, uh, which um, as far as I can tell has 25 components or separate observations within it. And then of course, as I mentioned, there's also the astrophysics um, GTO. So this, this is um, basically um, designed to be a sort of community service effort um, in the early parts of the James Webb mission. And for that reason, this data has mostly no proprietary period. I think there might be um, a little bit of proprietary period for some of the comet discovery um, part, but it's almost entirely, um, you know, once that data hits the ground, it gets processed, goes on the James Webb uh, data archive, and then anyone can, can basically step in and, and look at that data. So, um, so all the uh, projects and the people who design these are not going to get any proprietary um, period. And that's, that's because they didn't have to compete for this time. It was time that was given to them, but as a community service. And then the, um, because that was all planned a long, long time ago, um, there was kind of an update to that, which was this ERS, Early Release Science, which was a competed um, time program uh, for large projects that could do demonstration of capability. And again, um, one of the rules was that you can compete for these um, ERS uh, projects in the, in the early uh, year or two of the mission, but again, there'd be no proprietary period. And there was one solar system project that was selected for ERS um, for the Jovian system led by Imke de Pater um, down at Berkeley. And um, she's leading a pretty large team of you know, a couple of dozen people. So it's a big collaboration. And this is to do um, the Jovian system. So Jupiter, its rings, its moons, um, everything that's observable, uh, large moons, uh, small moons, um, the, whole, the whole Jovian system. And even though part of that was already included in the GTO project, um, the GTO project was not able to include everything. So even though there is uh, uh, giant planet observations, satellite observations, this is a, um, a, different, a different take on it that provides um, a more focused look at the Jovian system. And then more recently, there was the uh, general observer program. So this is just the, the start of the cycle one um, com competed observations um, PI-led projects, these will have proprietary time. You win, you, you go in competitively into the pool, and if you win it, you get your time, and it's proprietary for, I think, at least a year. And um, these um, geo uh, projects were um, selected um, in March of this year after uh, there were several delays, um, but uh, eventually that was competed, and these announcements were made. And these include a couple of different things. They include both new observations, but they also include archive, what's called AR, um, archive research projects. And the way that works is that the archive research projects can be for funding only, but not for new observation time. So for example, people who are on the GTO project actually um, do not get any funding um, for, for that project. Whereas people who submit and competitively win um, the general observer ones uh, do win uh, funding. So it's kind of like with Hubble or Sophia, if you win time, you also get data analysis funding. Um, people who were on the GTO project um, uh, did not get any funding at all. Um, so they were able to compete through the, the um, archive research part. It's kind of funny to be talking about the data archive before the data has been taken. Um, but um, so many people who are involved in the GTO side um, separately submitted funding proposals um, as archive research, as part of the um, cycle one geo. And uh, I was one of those people uh, who got awarded that. Okay. And as I said before, stop me at any point if you want to ask questions. Very happy to see questions. Hopefully this is all making sense. So I wanted to just run through the solar system GTO project. I understand that you had a, a talk a couple of weeks ago on the um, exoplanet um, or early science. So hopefully this is a good complement. You know, I'm not going to read these through in detail, but I just want to kind of give you the general flavor by, by, by showing you the projects that are there. Um, you can see here, and you can go and search on this uh, on Google and, and find, find these out. Any of these uh, red numbers up the side, this project ID, you can click on these and you will actually get a PDF that shows the submitted 
um, observation, the design, the science, the settings, and so on. So you know, there's no need for me to you know go through all these in detail. But you can see the flavor here. Um, for example, the giant planets, which was one of the ten original solar system teams, actually ended up submitting four separate um, projects. So one for Jupiter, one for Saturn, one for Uranus, one for Neptune. And you can see here that because the Jupiter one was just focused on the red spot, um, that then allowed the ERS team to come in and submit one for the entire Jovian system to kind of supplement that. Uh, also, you know, in, in not all cases were all of the instruments being used. So you can see um, probably MIRI um, being used most heavily and near spec, um, followed by near -CAN, not really very much with the uh, nearest instrument. So that, that also provided some gaps there. And on the next slide, I have the rest of the GTO projects and the website address. Um, easiest way to find it is just to Google um, James, you know, JWST GTO projects, and you'll find it very quickly. Um, but you can see that really runs the gamut of everything from uh, satellites, moons, KBOs, um, uh, asteroids, NEOs, um, TNOs, uh, you name it. And the green, um, you can see the green circles here. These show the ones that actually ended up having separate archive research requ uh, requests funded through the cycle one to actually provide funding to these individuals um, to do the science here. So you know you can see me at the top here. Um, I submitted this uh, 1251 um, GTO project um, along with Heidi for the Titan climate and then that was selected for our archive research. So let's look at the ERS and um, Sorry, there's a lot of words on the slide, but uh, let me just focus in on the um, on these three bullet points here. I've already mentioned this project's being led by um, by uh, uh, Imke uh, de Pater at Berkeley um, for the Jovian system. This was a competitively selected early release science project with no um, uh, no proprietary period, but it really it really does the whole Jovian system. You, so you can see here um, Jupiter itself, um, the atmosphere, and includes Io and the icy satellites, um, Ganymede, and so on. Um, search for plumes, and then you know the ring structure. Uh, so really, the whole the whole uh, Jovian system. And let me see if I have another slide on that. Okay, sorry, that's a duplicate. Um, yeah. So again, you can follow this website here at the top and um, search on this project thirteen seventy three, or or just search on um, solar system. Um, uh, ERS science, and you'll get you'll get more information here. You can go in and you can you can download their um, request, look at what they're exactly they're doing, and you know again for the people in this group, the emphasis is that the GTO and the ERS science is all publicly available from day one. So you can you can go, you can grab that data, you can grab the images right away. You can work with it, you can do your science, and um, if you haven't got funding for that, um, again you'll be able to compete through the um, through the next cycle two of the archive research to, to do um, science with the existing data. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities, for example, for you know, putting in projects that are interdisciplinary, right? So for people in this group doing things like um, looking at, uh, you know, comparing exoplanets to solar system objects, um, things like that have, have not been well, um, you know, covered, I think, in this, because people are still uh, looking in, um, Looking in their in their little shoe boxes and, and maybe not looking at the broader um, interdisciplinary science that's possible. Connor, can I ask a question about that? Um, how, how do you actually with JWST get maps of Io? Um, I mean, I've tried to observe satellites of well Titan actually of satellites of Saturn with with Spitzer, and you know the scattered light is horrendous, and you know it's a, you couldn't get spatial resolution. Is it just that JWST is you know, really good at spatial resolution and consequently you can separate all that stuff out. I'm just, I'm just wondering how, how you would actually go about making a map of, of that kind of object. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that's something we looked at very closely was the diffraction limited spatial resolution. <clears throat> um, obviously for, for the, for the giant planets for, for Jupiter and Saturn, that's not a problem. Um, but for the satellites, it's a good question. What, sort of spatial resolution can you get as a function of wavelength? So for example, um, uh, Titan is, is about an arc second in size. And the, um, the um, integral field mode of, of near spec 
which is the um, uh, order slicing uh, mode, which gives you the different spectral images, gives you um, pixels that are a tenth of an arc second <clears throat> in that kind of one to five micron range. So you're getting about 10, 10 pixels across Titan. So it's not, you know, we're not talking about Cassini level of imaging here of Titan surface, where you, you zoom in and you see a lake and you can look at the shoreline and all this type of stuff. We're talking about sort of um, big, big things, um, big regions, um, kind of continent to subcontinent size kind of um, changes, changes in surface brightness. Um, for, let's see, for Ganymede and, and Io, um, yeah, so you're, you're going to do a little bit better. Again, you know, good questions about the, the scatter light, you know, Io being very close to Jupiter, that's, um, that's an issue. Um, you know, Ganymede, I think you could do pretty well. Um, Ganymede's basically the same size as Titan, but um, obviously twice, twice as close to the Earth. So if you can get 10 um, pixels on Titan, you can get 20 pixels on Ganymede. So, um, it, you know, it's not going to compete with, um, for example, we know that, you know, Juno is going to be flying by uh, Ganymede, I think it's this month, actually, um, it's one of its first close flybys. And, um, and then making more flybys. And, and of course, there's those other Juvian missions. I'm not going to compete with that, but um, the, you know, the, the infrared spectroscopic capability, which is on James Webb, is, is not on those other missions. So I think that, I think that you know, to me, the benefit is going to be in that near-infrared spectroscopy, where you can basically get the entire spectrum unoccluded by the Earth's atmosphere. So you know, for example, comparing James Webb to Cassini, um, on Cassini, there was an instrument called VIMS, the, which was the near infrared spectrometer. And it was a one to five micron instrument, but its resolving power was um, at a maximum was 300, whereas um, James Webb was gonna go to 3000. So it's not gonna have the same spatial resolution, but it's going to have 10 spectral elements for every one that VIMS had. So in that sense, it's gonna be able to tease apart some of those, some of those bands, um, surface you know, mineral bands or whatever that, um, that Cassini couldn't do. Okay, great, great. And, and yeah, and don't worry, for exoplanet scientists, uh, 10, 20 pixels would be a fantastic luxury, so. so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I'll, you know, I'm going to compare uh, later on some of the, you know, the James Webb science to Cassini, you know, so in many respects, um, we have this luxury of having Cassini and having the spacecraft up close, but in, in some of the instrumental um, advantages James Webb has are, are going to be new. Um, so very, very quickly go through the, the, the geo selections. Um, you know, I'm not even going to spend a lot of time on those, but these are supplementary to what was done in the in the GTO and the ERS. Again, you can see kind of the gamut of everything in the solar system: uh, giant planets, um, you know, TNOs, comets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's um, what's called target of opportunity observations in here. Uh, let me see it maybe on a later slide. For example, here you can see um, 2337 composition of an interstellar object. So obviously, this is going to be a project which is going to be a what's called a triggered observation. Um, if a new uh, interstellar object, something that's on a um, you know hyperbolic trajectory, comes along, then this will be triggered, and this will get um, this amount of time with these instruments. Um, that's what's called a TO or target of opportunity observation. So it won't it won't otherwise have a guaranteed um, time. And that's the rest of them. You can see here the things that are listed as AR are the archive research projects that are not. Um, actually taking new observations, but they're, they're analyzed in other um, observations. Uh, so what I did is I kind of, I wanted to try and summarize that because that's kind of like a lot of, it's a lot of words and it's a lot of tables and so on, a lot of um, uh, titles and so on. So just to kind of summarize what, you know, how do these categories kind of break down? So you can see here, for example, that, um, you know, as expected, um, Pluto and TNOs are actually quite highly represented. So out of the 18 GTO projects, a full third of those were on those, those objects. And out of the um, 22 in the um, uh, uh, GEO, there was four plus, I think, one or two of the archive ones that were on TNOs. So, you know, people really using that sensitivity of James Webb to get to the, to the Kuiper belt, because of course we only had, um, you know, arguably only one mission that's, that's, that's done a lot in the Kuiper belt, which is uh, New Horizons. Um, the other spacecraft that have left the solar system didn't really encounter any um, objects. So, um, you know, we know very, very little about the sort of part of the solar system. Uh, James Webb could do a fantastic job on some of these um, 
uh, uh, TNOs and, and, and KBOs. And you know, who knows if if uh, the people who are successfully looking for Planet Nine um, are able to detect that object, then um, James Webb will be a really ideal um, vehicle for for looking at that. So that, that's kind of the way things break down. Um, you can see, for example, you know, Mars is really under underrepresented. You know, why is that? Well, you know, of course, like we know so much about Mars, we have spacecraft, we have landers, we have rovers, we have orbiters. So, you know, there's there's maybe like less new things that you can do with Mars compared to what you can do with the outer solar system. So th these are things that you can kind of think about when you think in terms of the exoplanet science as well. Uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the on the Titan stuff, and then I'm going to kind of wrap up. Um, the Titan GTO observations that I was involved in, we proposed for for three of the four instruments: near spec, near cam, and MIRI. Um, with um, near spec and near cam, we're actually doing um, Titan twice. We're doing leading hemisphere and trailing hemisphere because, of course, we can see the surface and we want to see both sides. Um, Titan being tightly locked, we need to basically look at it on two different um, elongations. Um, with MIRI, we're only looking at Titan once, and that's because the atmosphere is is fairly um, zonally symmetric, and MIRI is almost entirely sensitive to the atmosphere. Uh, but we're you know we're kind of running the gamut, going through. Um, most of the filters that are available. In fact, I think with NearCam we're going through all the filters basically, just to you know, just to kind of set benchmarks for for what can be done in every filter. Try to get ideas of integration times and so on. It could be useful for people planning future observations, you know. And, and maybe you know, hopefully they'll all, um, they'll all work out perfectly, and we haven't saturated any filters. But you know, maybe we'll we'll have uh, screwed up and we'll have saturated one of the one of the broadband filters, right? And in that case, it's going to be useful to have this information so that when people plan cycle two and cycle three and cycle four, you know, better, better to know these things early on. Okay, um, so I've split this into five thematic areas. Um, and by the way, each of these um, 10 uh, GTO solar system projects uh, wrote a paper, which is in PASP. So there's a journal issue of PASP and you can find the Titan paper there and all the other um, papers there as well which really go into this in, in all the detail you want. So uh, we have, you know, kind of going upwards from the surface. Then in the troposphere, we have clouds, lower atmosphere composition into the stratosphere, and then kind of the upper stratosphere, mesosphere, where we have Titan's haze. So JWST can address all five of these um, disciplines. It just can't get into the very, into the very high uh, diffuse atmosphere, kind of like the thermosphere, ionosphere that Cassini was able to sample. So James Webb here is focused on, on these parts of the atmosphere, kind of from the lower, um, lower middle to kind of middle atmosphere, but not on these higher reaches of the atmosphere. Um, so this is what Titan's surface uh, looks like. <clears throat> because of all the haze surrounding Titan, um, you know, I haven't given you a lot of background on Titan, so I'm presuming a little bit of background knowledge here, but you know, Titan is this very hazy moon. It's got a very thick, dense atmosphere that took a very long time for us to figure out how to see through it. And we're finally able to see through it using some tricks. And the tricks were to basically um, find wavelengths where there, the haze was, was low on opacity. But also we had to look through these um, kind of spectral windows um, in between methane absorption. So Titan has a lot of methane in the atmosphere. It's kind of like the equivalent of like water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. It's the, um, it's the substance which reaches its triple point um, so it can form uh, it can be in three different phases, or it can it can form. Certainly, we know it can form liquid, and it can evaporate and go in the atmosphere and form clouds, and probably ice clouds as well. So uh, it has these very very broadened uh, near infrared absorptions, and you have to look in between these bands. And if you actually target your your filters just right, then you can see to the surface. And this is this is what was seen by Cassini, and this is first of all it's a huge improvement <laughs> over nothing. Um, but at the same time, you can see that in places it's still pretty, um, it's pretty blotchy. Um, of course, getting high high resolution on, on Titan will will require going back with like a dedicated orbiter. But in the meantime, I think um, what James Webb can contribute is looking at some of these um, brighter and darker areas, but looking at them with a higher spectral resolution than has been done previously. So you can see here um, something I alluded to earlier, which is the spectral imaging of Titan with JUST is going to give us information on the composition, including things like, um, is there uh, liquid uh, uh, ethane or ethane on the surface? So you can see here in the second 
from left, this is the VIMS um, low resolution spectroscopy at a resolving power of just a couple hundred. Um, and then near spec at its three different resolutions. So at the low, lowest resolution, it's comparable to Cassini. And then as it gets higher and higher, you get um, better and better um, resolutions. It's actually going to enable these um, you know, ethane bands to be teased apart from other substances, such as um, you know, propane and um, other things that could be liquid at Titan's surface. So, so let's talk about clouds for a second. So th this is one of my favorite images from the entire Cassini mission. And um, this kind of big um, chevron thing here, actually just looks like someone's just painted an arrow on the surface, or maybe it's a giant bird or something opening its wings. But you know, this, this look, looked to me when I first saw it as something kind of unbelievable, but this is actually a real feature. And this is kind of like a Titan version of a derecho storm kind of sweeping across the surface. And, and yes, it does seem to have this kind of tail behind it as well. And one thing that was noticed is that right after this storm came through, and, and this is huge, this is like on the order of a thousand kilometers, it actually changed the surface um, albedo. So the, the surface actually got darkened, it's a near infrared wavelengths. And then Cassini saw that on a flyby, and then when Cassini came back several months later, because of course it was orbiting Saturn, not orbiting Titan, came back a few months later, looked at the surface, and the surface was back to its original brightness again. So that indicated that there had been like a, a methane um, thunderstorm that basically soaked the surface and maybe filled in some of the porosity in the ice and um, changed the uh, reflectivity. And then a couple of months later, it had uh, brightened up again. So um, again, you know, James Webb could potentially, um, uh, you know, look for features of this size. We certainly have the resolution that if there was a cloud, you know, we hit it at the right time, we could see these, these type of features. Um, maybe another thing we could look at for the future, which we don't have right now, is doing something like a triggered observation of Titan, where we have ground-based monitoring of Titan that would find out when a large storm is sweeping by, and then we could have James Webb come on and look at it. So what we what we did here, uh, so this shows um, some adaptive optics work done from the Earth that shows, uh, you know, kind of uh, fairly similar. This is with Gemini, so you know, fairly similar to Webb type of resolution. Um, some some of these kind of like these bigger storm features or or clouds that can be seen, and these were um, taken by uh, Emily Schaller, and these were these were done at Caltech, and these were a triggered observation. So they actually had a very small telescope. I think it was on the roof of the of the Caltech um, uh, Earth and Planetary Science Building, and they had a, a small telescope. It was basically looking at Titan just as a single pixel, but it could detect changes um, spectroscopically, so it could see when some of the um, the near infrared bands changed in depth. And then that indicated that there was a cloud sweeping by and then that triggered observations at Gemini. Um, so that was a really cool um, project that, led by Mike Brown. Um, that enabled these um, early images of clouds even before um, Cassini. So uh, what about Webb? Well, with Webb, what we did here is we, um, we took um, a VIMS image, which of course um, we mentioned that VIMS the Cassini um, infrared instrument was able to do very high spatial resolution being being close up. And then we took this high spatial resolution image and we, we degraded it um, to the web resolution as a function of wavelength. So you can see these different filters here. Um, we have like 0 0.9 microns, 1.62, 2.1, 3.35, etc. And um, you can see here that this cloud that was detected by VIMS um, if you degrade this to the, the web resolution, you can just about pick out this, this cloud feature, but certainly anything bigger than that we'd be able to pick out. Okay. So what, uh, this was a prediction of the, the clouds kind of coming and going seasonally. So across the x-axis here, you have the, um, the time since um, equinox, and this is over uh, Titan or Saturn's 30 year um, seasonal cycle. And then, and then you have latitude here. So what? So these are kind of showing you a frequency distribution of clouds that were seen during the Cassini mission, and how they compare to the um, colored contours below, which is the model expectations. So you can see that the clouds are expected to kind of, you know, peak in the south, and then as as it um, changes season um, to the northern summer solstice, the clouds move into the north. And the actual distribution that was seen by Cassini was a little bit different to that. So. The, uh, so, so what about web? Well, the fact is that we don't have Cassini anymore. So if we want to get into the 
you know, the next part of this um, seasonal cycle. You can see here 2020 up top here, anything from 2020 to 2030, um, you know, Cassini ended in 2017. So this whole decade um, will have to be explored without Cassini. So if we want to fill in this part of the map and, and see how the models compare to the data, then we're going to need um, uh, telescopes like Webb to tell us how those stack up. Uh, as far as tropospheric composition goes, um, you can see here, um, this is a high resolution um, uh, spectra of, of methane. Uh, one of the questions about methane is, is it, is it really uniformly distributed, <clears throat> especially with latitude? Is it kind of like a well-mixed gas or does it actually have latitudinal banding? And <clears throat> that was something that was not really well answered by Cassini. There was kind of conflicting evidence for that. Um, there was a paper that um, by Lelouch that said that there was uh, some latitudinal banding that was occurring, um, but we, we weren't able to tell for sure. Well, so uh, Webb, uh, even with this 10 pixels across Titan, does have enough to kind of get at some of this latitudinal structure. And because it's got this very, very high um, uh, spectral resolution, it should actually be able to give us some more um, information on this problem as to whether the, the methane is, uh, is uniform or not. And then looking here at the stratosphere, whoops, um, which is kind of, you know, one of the areas that I particularly focus on, um, as Vicky mentioned, I was the deputy principal investigator of the Sears instrument, which was the kind of long wavelength um, infrared spectrometer. And this is the comparable part of the spectrum uh, to Cassini Sears, um, but this time with JWST Miri, the mid infrared instrument. And again, you know, showing showing here the the the, the peak, uh, you know, the, the very best spectral resolution that James Webb will get at a resolving power of about um, three thousand right across the spectrum. The main advantage here, it actually has the same uh, spectral resolution as Cassini Sears, so we're not going to see um, anything at a higher resolution. But it does have a very very high sensitivity, <clears throat> and that can enable us to see some things that were kind of buried in the noise level for the Cassini Sears observations. And you can see here, there's a red line here, which indicates the saturation um, threshold in Jansky's per pixel. So it actually, um, there's, a, there's a danger here that some of these brighter bands like the um, ethane and the acetylene um, would be saturated um, you know, in, a, in a long enough um, observation. So we have to be very careful about how we, we take these observations. And um, yeah, kind of, Getting a little bit higher in the atmosphere here, we can probe some of this mesosphere with the um, with the near infrared. And the, the reason is because no, normally you would need um, because the atmosphere is not very strongly thermally emitting at these wavelengths. You would normally need um, an occultation. So the way Cassini um, did this part of the the high atmosphere was to look at look at occultation for the most part. So stellar occultation, solar occultation measurements. Um, but there is a little bit of emission. And the reason why there's emission is you get fluorescent emission for some of these bands. And this is what you see here. So this was um, from Cassini, uh, VIMS showing a kind of like a day glow emission that was um, stimulated emission. And there's a good chance that Webb could also um, pick out some of these uh, gases. And this actually gets us a little bit higher in the atmosphere compared to the mid infrared. So it gives us a little bit more of that vertical, vertical structure. Um, you know, again, again for exoplanets, I, I think this is quite an important thing to think about is, especially with some of these uh, hotter exoplanets, is whether some of these molecular bands could be, um, you know, could be seen in, in day glow. And I, I know you're all very experienced in um, occultation science as well. So um, and you see here the pH band that's, that's indicated, so that was very interesting. Um, that was not resolved by Cassini, but maybe this could be resolved by Webb. And then what about Titan's famous haze? So you can see here on the left, kind of a nice um, high phase angle image looking back at the sun that kind of picks out all these um, kind of layers, kind of looking at the sunset. Uh, very, very many layers. A, a lot of the, the reason for this um, multi-layered structure is not entirely known. There's, there's kind of two competing effects that could be going on here. One is kind of a chemical layering where you see things that just get created or destroyed at a particular altitude at a particular temperature, or it could be due to dynamical effects. So it could be due to the, the atmospheric circulation, um, you know, moving around particles of different sizes and shapes and creating kind of layers. Um, we don't know what the relative importance of those two effects is. It's still being, uh, it's still like a very active area of modeling right now. So something that people are 
are studying pretty hard. But you can see here on the right, um, this is what Titan looked like with um, with Hubble. Um, and this this was imaging that was done. You can see here from 1992 through 2002, so um, pre Cassini era. And one of the most notable things is that Titan has kind of a seasonal reversal in some of the wavelengths. So you can see here, for example, at the at the 899, it's brighter in the south in um, 1992, and then, and then over time, this shifts and then it becomes brighter in the north. And then at other wavelengths, um, the opposite happens. So here at 439, it's brighter in the, in the north, um, and then it goes through and then it becomes brighter in the south, so it kind of reverses. So depending on what wavelength you're looking at, you see these um, uh, different effects going on with, with the haze reversal. So there seems to be a real um, dynamical shift of haze particles from hemisphere to hemisphere. And again, that's Connor, yeah. Sorry, the, the difference in the apparent size of Titan in these images, is that because they were done at different times, or is that actually that there's that much bright darkening at the limb? Oh, yeah, good good question. Um, I'd have to check on that, but I, I, <clears throat> I suspect that these are all just, um, it's just a different distance of Titan. OK. Yeah, I don't think you would get that much change in the limb brightening or darkening. Yeah, I mean, otherwise it was pretty impressive, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, right. Yeah, I mean, that would, that would be a very big change. And that'd be like a, I don't know, like a 20 or 25% change. So that's not, um, that's not gonna be feasible. So yeah, it's the difference in um, distance. So Titan obviously getting um, down to what is like 8.5 um, uh, to 10.5. Um, AU, so that provides a bit of a distance there. Distance change. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Okay, um, I'm done with Titan, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, this is the most recent timeline that I can find for the James Webb project. You can ignore that we are here, um, but the launch of winter 2021 is, is what I want to focus on. So this kind of, this at least is, is current. Um, the cycle one observations beginning probably early 2022. Um, the spacecraft takes several months to get out to its um, uh, L, L2 position and, um, and deploy and then um, get checked out before it can start doing science. And let's see. Yeah, so just a few kind of concluding thoughts um, about exoplanet science. So uh, Vicky asked me to, you know, to try to answer this question about what are the synergies. I've tried to touch on some ideas as I go through the seminar, um, but here's just a few more kind of uh, concluding remarks. Um, there's a kind of, uh, it's, it's sort of commonly said that, you know, most of the exoplanets that are seen are um, kind of of the Neptune size or probably more realistically sub-Neptune size, sort of less than three, um, Earth diameters. Um, and that was a thousand out of 2,600 Kepler planets is, is what I found. So even by studying Neptune, which is perhaps a little bit on the bigger size range, um, you know, we could find out um, quite a lot about uh, this category of planets that are that are hard to study, obviously, in exoplanet systems, but a little bit easier to study in, in the solar system. As far as isotopic ratios goes, um, isotopic ratios are really sensitive constraints, especially things like D over H on the solar system formation models in terms of how many, uh, you know, what percentage of, um, of ices went into the giant planet cores versus secreted gas. So it has real implications for the solar system formation models. And, you know, really, if we can understand our own solar system formation, we could probably get some, some really useful information about the formation of, of all planetary systems. And that's not to say that all planetary systems form identically, um, but definitely some of the same processes are going to be at work. Uh, you know, comets and TNOs, these are the primitive bodies of the solar system. So there's something that we, we still don't know, uh, you know, a heck of a lot about. We know quite a bit about short period comets. We know quite a bit less about long period comets. But when you get out to the TNOs, we know very little. And you can see that in the, um, in the web programs that there was a lot focusing on these really cold objects. So we're going to find a lot more about this outer um, part of our solar system that's poorly known. Um, but something that may be, you know, a really active area of study for, for exoplanet systems, right, is to look at these 
um, you know, discs that are forming to look at um, uh, planetesimals. So really looking at our own kind of residual planetesimal disc is going to be really important. That's something that Webb can do. And then as far as atmospheres and biosignatures, um, Webb is going to really probe atmospheric compositions, um, not just Titan, but all the planets and moons that have atmospheres and give us really important, I think, information about, um, about biomarkers. So from, you know, from what I've followed in the exoplanet debate, there's, there's, there's just always um, really heated, heated discussion about, you know, what exactly constitutes a biomarker. Can you have a single gas? Probably not, but can you have a combination of gases? Can you have, you know, is it like methane and oxygen in the same place? Or, you know, what, what is it that, that, that constitutes a disequilibrium species that could be a robust biomarker? And I think that by studying planets in our own solar system, and then many of these we can actually go to, such as, such as Mars and now Venus and so on, and study them in situ as well as astronomically um, and tell, you know, are there really microbes there? Um, that can really kind of help us to um, get a more robust idea as to what, what is a biosignature, a biomarker. So those are just some of the things I think that um, may be of interest to exoplanet scientists as far as the solar system program with James Webb goes. And that is it. That I'm, that's the end of my talk. So I will stop here. I, I want to thank um, uh, Vicky again for inviting me to give this talk and, um, and the rest of the department for, for hosting me here virtually. And um, I'm more than happy to take any, any questions you have. Hey, wonderful. We can all clap virtually and otherwise. Um, thanks so much for that, Claire. Um, that was actually great. I, I love that last slide too. That was a, that's a good jumping off point for discussion, I think. Um, okay, do people have questions? You feel free to just type it in the chat and I can read it out or just unmute yourself and leap in there. Or you can put your hand up on the on the list. Lots of things to do. Any questions? Well, maybe while people are gathering their thoughts there, I can. Um, oh, Tim, you want to ask a question? I just wanted to comment on, I, uh, I really appreciated the slide where you showed how uh, the saturation affects which parts of the mid IR spectrum of Titan you can measure. You know, as you know, my big favorite is Jupiter Aurora and I kind of had to give up the mid infrared Aurora uh, because it was just blinded JWST. So there's lots of other science, but I felt bad about that. So I, I appreciated what you had there and, there's clearly a lot more Titan spectrum that uh, that JWST will be able to get uh, meaningful information on, even though it's not the part dear to my heart. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, th I think um, when you have James Webb pointing at some of these fairly bright, you know, relatively speaking objects, um, you know, brighter really than than, than James Webb was, was designed for, um, we do have this issue, and it's it's kind of like maybe. Like having an owl kind of stare at a car headlight. Headlight. So it's really, yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of overkill. So we, we went to pretty extreme lengths to just try and get these very, very short, um, short integrations, you know, like a second or something like that, and then just stack them up to try to get um, good data. But it's, it, it, that was the biggest problem. Yeah, and it's not at all wavelengths, but definitely in that kind of middle part of the infrared spectrum, um, where the Planck function really peaks up on. Some of these bodies, it's, it's a real problem. Okay, other questions? No, I'll ask one while people get ready for that. So can you talk a little bit more about how the isotope ratios in the giant planet atmospheres can potentially discriminate whether or not the grand tack happened, for example? Um, you sort of alluded to that at the end. Do you know, do you know how that works? Well, I mean, so, it's a good question. I mean, if the, you know, if Jupiter and Saturn and, the, and those objects had, had already fully formed, then the isotopic ratios would really be telling you more about how they originally formed. That's really what I was getting at was the, was the sort of the, um, the relative contribution of those um, rocky planetesimals versus the accreted gas, because you know, hydrogen can come from two different mechanisms. You can get it from the ice or you can get it from the, from the accreted H2. Now, whether that would specifically tell you about Grand Tack or not, um, that would maybe only come into play if their compositions had got altered through collisions um, later on. Um, right, so you know, you can't trace the actual migration process. It doesn't, it doesn't give you a signature of that occurring. 
Because that's fascinating. I mean, from an exoplanet standpoint, and migration obviously was the big surprise in exoplanet science that that you know this idea that planets just don't stay where you where you form them. Um, so yeah, so that was that was just very interesting. If we can learn something from the solar system um, that lets yeah. us know whether or not you know what our migration scenario was early on, that would be that would be super useful. I, I think there's there, there's there's tons of like really open questions in the solar system. So when you know when we look at our solar system, we think oh. It, there was these eight planets or whatever and things have always been like that forever um but there's evidence of all these like really catastrophic events that have happened like scattered throughout the solar system such as you know uranus being tipped on its side you know how did that happen um there's no there's no way it could have formed like that so something ha had to have happened whether it was a you know, collision or resonance or something um and um there's evidence, of course, for you know the moon uh, being formed by a part of the Earth, or you know collision with a Mars-sized object. Um, there's there's pretty pretty open questions about um, about Mars itself. Did it suffer a big uh, impact that kind of um, um, kind of sculpted its northern hemisphere and left it at a lower um, altitude than its southern hemisphere? So there's all these really big uh, uh, you know questions. So, for example, um, if there was a sort of a ground tack thing happening, that clearly would have scattered. A lot of residual um, objects that may still have been throughout the solar system, like uh, the residual asteroid belts, could have, could have been disrupted and things like that. Um, so, sort of hand waving a bit here, but I think what I'm saying is that just getting a better handle on our own solar system, um, you know, is, is going to give us um, more um, a more a more robust framework, I think, to to begin to look at exoplanet systems, and they may have had their own totally different. Um, things happening, but I think some of the processes will turn out to be the same. Yeah, the context is key. Uh, Mike, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, great talk, Connor. Um, I think it's absolutely astounding what JWST will be able to do for Titan. I was wondering if you know whether JWST can uh, observe Enceladus's plumes or if that is asking too much. Yeah, so, Let's, let's talk about that. So there is a there is a um, GTO project specifically to look for Enceladus and, and Europa plumes. Um, that's being led by Geronimo uh, Villanueva, and there there may also be a little bit of that in the ERS program. But there is a GTO project specifically to do that. And um, I think, as I recall, the idea is that they would try to look for fluorescent water emission. So JWC is very very sensitive, and you know, we've talked about it saturating, but this is maybe one of the one of the places where that high high sensitivity is going to is going to help you. Is if you have something that's very very, you have something like a plume that's very very thin, it's very very diffuse. You're trying to add up, um, you know, water fluorescent emission, but you know, it's spread out very very thinly in a very in a very diffuse plume. Can you add up enough photons to actually detect that? Um, obviously, it's a lot easier to detect in the way that Cassini did it. You know, by looking back and doing the high phase angle scattering. But um, could you actually detect it through through that part of the spectrum. Um, all I can tell you is that it's, it's, it's gonna be looked for. It's gonna be looked for in cycle one. And we'll know the answer. Um, as far as spatial resolution goes, you know, you're, I think Enceladus, it's a 10th of the size of Titan. So it's basically one pixel for, for, uh, for um, sorry, for near spec. Um, and then the plume itself is gonna be even smaller and that's gonna be sub pixel. So, can you distinguish between Enceladus scattered light and plume, you know, plume emission, things like that? I, I don't know the answer. That's going to be, that's going to be really tough. Um, you know, one of the things that I looked at, in fact, was trying to use um, coronography using uh, corona masks to, to try to mask out Enceladus or Europa to then just get the plume. Um, but it's so hard because those objects are so bright that even when you look at the um, the little bit of light that that that, that comes out, you know, because a chronograph is not a perfect like a cutout. It it has a little bit of scattered light around the edges, and that would be more than enough, in my view, to to really swamp the the plume. So, so maybe it'll it'll be doable um, in this GTU project. We'll we'll see. Okay. Um. Yeah. We we tried a similar thing with Spitzer way back in the waybacks, Connor, and it was yeah, it was absolutely swamped by scattered light from Saturn, basically. Pull it out of that. So, but with better spatial resolution, maybe, you know, but, but with Spitzer, it was, it was hopeless. Um, okay, any other questions? 
for people. So, so maybe let me just reiterate a couple of you know sources of further further information if you if you're interested. Um, again, these um, all ten of the uh, G two projects have their own papers, which are in PSP. Um, you can find those. Uh, I believe 2016. Um, there were also white papers that were submitted, but but then they eventually made into journal papers. So that's really the best source. Um, all these projects, as I said, you can you can download all the projects. Um, maybe not the geo ones, but definitely the GTO and the ERS ones. You can download the whole observation description, which may be helpful for you in terms of you know designing your own observations if you have cool ideas. Um, and also, there's a sort of ongoing series of, of workshops for JWST. They had a particularly um, big crop of those in the advance of the of the geo one. I think they've sort of died died down a little bit since then, but they'll be I'm sure I'll sure they'll be restarting next year in advance of the, the geo two um, announcement. So there's you know look out for those workshops. They're very helpful in terms of helping you to um, learn how to propose and use the um, proposal tool and all that kind of kind of stuff. So those are those are mostly run by the Space Telescope Institute. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk and all of the information. Um, I learned a ton of things because um, I hadn't been keeping up with, with all this stuff. So that was great. Um, all right. And so um, I think we'll thank Connor again for uh, that talk. More will clap virtually. Um, okay. And so uh, for the series going forward, we're going to take a hiatus over the summer. Laura and I made an executive decision. <laughs> we're going to take off July and August. Um, so we will meet again in September. So um, following the, the sort of cadence that we've had, September would be an exoplanet scientist talking to planetary scientists about something or solar system planetary scientists, rural planetary scientists, but talking to the solar system folks about something. Um, and so if you have any suggestions, please let Laura or I know um, uh, if you'd like to hear somebody talk on a particular topic. Um, all right, so thanks again, Connor, and thanks everybody for, for um, coming to attend and, and uh, listen, and we will catch up with you in September. Have a wonderful summer. All right, bye for now. Thanks again.